Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U T H I O P I A dot com. As a lad, I liked a good scrap, the master confessed to his disciple. Really? exclaimed Berda, who spoiled at times for a good fight himself. And when did you outgrow this foolish practice? When I reached two scores and four, explained Zereyakob, I discovered, then, that I began to be outfoxed. If I'd been able to continue to hold my own, I would probably have continued. And so it is with most men who, hemmed in by circumstance, claim to have chosen what they practice and what they have foregone. The Apocrypha of Zereyakob Samuel Johnson N. The earliest thing Samuel Johnson could remember was his mother chiding him. You are a blockhead, for what enters through the one ear whistles out the other, which does not seem to have been fair, as not only was Johnson capable of serving up her words verbatim five decades later during an August ramble in the Welsh hills, he seemed inordinately liking of the jibe himself. One will recall Samuel Johnson's own dictum, no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. The birth of the cantankerous lexicographer took place in a wedge-shaped house that rather resembled a bookend in Lichfield, lodgings which stood in as the de facto chambers of his father a solicitor engaged in commercial jurisprudence and trade law. It was his mother who ministered to Samuel Johnson's education, dispensing many a slap, as well as robust beatings with her wooden spoons, all the while commenting on his lack of audition and other shortcomings, which were very numerous, even if they lacked a good definition at the time. Not only could Samuel Johnston still repeat the exact words his mother had ladled him with, he could pinprick under which failings the thrashings had been administered, and in which of the four rooms that made up their Litchfield house, which was built over three stories, tall and narrow and ill-conceived, such as myself, he would later recount. He could recall where these drubbings had taken place, and even according to his biographer, if had it had been the woolnut or the chestnut spoon that had been used on the day. Boswell, for it is he, the biographer, of course, detailed for us the man of flesh under the wooden mask of the writer, details that prove nearly too profuse at times, as the faithful biographer leads us into a tangle of reminiscing that shrouds rather than unveils the trunk we seek, concentrating as it does on the essence of wood used for some long whittled spoons. In this manner, the biographer makes a complete list of the doctor's quirks. Johnson cannot speak without first of all twisting his mouth sideways, blinking each eye in turn while dragging behind him her leg, which, even though in good working order, seems lethargic. And all this is only the preamble to the act of speech. When it erupts, this speech, it emerges in the guise of an eruption of lava bursting from a dormant volcano. Syncretic pronunciations bubble to the fore, and a hissing spittle provides the public with as much food as drink and this up to a distance of nearly four yards. 
Boswell is present to take stock of the indignities of the doctor's body. Indigestions are much commented upon. A number of lengthy stations in the water closet are described in detail. Visits, which the biographer would have us believe, are due to Johnson's near-exclusive diet of mint sauce and roast beef. The doctor gets the petit mal when presented with green-coloured foods, the sole exception being the mint sauce mentioned here above, for which he has a strong liking. His sole vegetable is the potato, and, averse to water, he even resorts to ale for gargling. Unsurprisingly, his ailing body seems sometimes the worse for this drought. He releases volleys of mordant words, often droll and cruel as well. The crabby man, we can diagnose in hindsight, is subject to Tourette syndrome, a condition in which the sufferer cannot avoid holding forth with unsavoury comments. The filthier the words, the more delectable they are, a condition often accompanied by the physical foibles that Boswell describes with such minutia. Yet, under this pitiable man of flesh, hides an august personage of paper and ink. Samuel Johnson launches his career as a man of letters with a translation of the works of the Jesuit, Geronimo Lobo, a work of scientific bearing, bar the mention of the unicorns that congregate in abundance in the province of Agomadur. The Jesuit's account is unpretentious, while the man himself, who is first to describe the spring of the mighty Nile, is as fearless as he is self-effaced in equal measures. And the book is a fount of knowledge on all things Ethiopian. Upon the death of his mother, and despite the spoon beatings, Johnson will recall these stories of Abyssinian princekins incarcerated atop of rock pitons. The doctor will put to good use countless details from Lobo's book on the customs and true habits of the land of the Ethiops. Johnson is birthed as a writer by an Ethiopian translation, and he shall go on to write in three weeks a moral tale that becomes a resounding success throughout Europe, The Prince of Abyssinia, a tale, later better known simply as Rasselas. But, and this is far more important to the doctor, the tale affords him the expenses for the burial of his mother. Rasselas seems to be a portmanteau of Ras, a title, literally a head, a something akin to Duke, and the name Silas, an Abyssinian lord, first portrayed by Lobo as a brother to the king and a staunch defender of the Catholic faith. The invention of Johnson foreshadows the word Rastafarianism. A Jamaican temple built in the skies, with its head in the clouds of Abyssinia and its feet lying in the West Indies, would have perhaps ventured, the lexicographer, not known to take any prisoners when crafting a definition, save princes spirited away from Mount Abora. One may still recall Johnson's definition of oats as being a grain which in England is generally given to horses. However, in Scotland, it supports the people. The Scottish explorer, James Bruce, as socially inept as Johnson, which should at least have inspired the latter to hold back his volleys a little, will bear the full brunt of Johnson's ire, for, though a giant of a man, still the Scot can't resist self-aggrandizement. Upon his return from Abyssinia, where Bruce has been travelling for many years, governing whole provinces and impressing royalty with his equestrian skills. Bruce lays claim in London society to having discovered the springs of the Nile that had eluded both Cambys and Alexander, as Bruce Mimley says. The immodest Scot cannot answer an inquiry 
at the end of a society dinner on the musical instruments to be found in Ethiopia, or to whether Abyssinians partake of cheese, only upon another occasion to wax lyrical on the pure notes of their Abyssinian lyre and a foodstuff somewhat akin to haggis and composed of milk and whey, the good Johnsonian word that immediately begins to make the rounds of London is that it is Bruce himself that is the Abyssinian liar, and that the only clot the Ethiopians ever possessed is now sorely missing from that country. The conceited Scot, whose probity all accounts by later travellers will corroborate, is ridiculed by all London. Call it a classic smear case, Johnson will be overheard expostulating to a crony. And when, two years later, the adventures of the Baron of Munchausen are a publishing success throughout Europe, the book's dedication will be inscribed to one Monsieur James Bruce, Abyssinian traveller extraordinaire. Today, if the good and caustic doctor's exemplum is infrequently read, which is a mistake, as it is a most excellent morality tale, the name Rasselas, the Romanesque invention of a London writer hard-pressed for cash to lay his abusive mother to rest, is a name at times conferred by contemporary Ethiopians, especially in the American diaspora, to their male offspring. <laughs>